Fallout 4's weapon customization system blows every other Fallout game out of the water. But just like with Fallout 3 and New Vegas, there are ways to defeat foes without using guns, explosives, or melee weapons. Can you beat Fallout 4 with only the Pain Train perk? Pain Train is a perk in Fallout 4 that lets you damage enemies when you sprint into them while wearing power armor. Because it essentially turns power armor into a living, breathing weapon, it requires strength of 10. The kind of person who dreams about being a train pays no mind to intelligence, but does put enough points into luck to get the Idiot Savant perk, which has been mathematically proven to be a superior method of gaining experience compared to maxing out intelligence. Endurance is useful to take damage. Agility is necessary because sprinting drains your action points, which are influenced by your agility and charisma to get a slight discount on stim packs from vendors. With my body almost more than ready, my husband and I ran to the vault. I did a sweet 360 as I got into the circle on the center. We went under the ice. I discovered that you could pound on the glass when you wake up to watch your child get abducted by a sentient cereal box, and then I woke up. Escaping Vault 101 while not attacking any of the rad roaches is beyond trivial at this point. I escaped the vault, arrived at Sanctuary, got some delicious experience from Codsworth, used the Your Special book to bump my strength up to 10 so that I'd be able to get the Pain Train perk when I leveled up, and began ransacking every single house I could find for garbage while Codsworth got to work on our little bug problem. I have no idea how he managed to stay alive for the last 200 years because he can levitate off the ground and yet somehow he got himself stuck on a barrel. Or maybe he was just really into bloat fly stings. He even said he doesn't feel pain, so it's probably that. I had things to do, so I fast traveled to Sanctuary from Sanctuary. Codsworth had taken care of that bug, and I went to town, scrapping every object in every house and all the land within this stupid little green boundary. I quite literally spent 10 minutes disposing of Sanctuary's trash. I built a few boxes to store my valuables and was off to the Museum of Freedom because that's the closest set of powered armor. It took a few tries to get up on the roof, but I succeeded in getting a suit of powered armor. I let Preston take care of the raiders outside the museum's entrance. I leveled up, put the point into pain train, and went inside the museum to demolish everyone I could find. That's almost true. I went inside without the armor to snag a fusion core, then left the building and got back in my power armor to begin riding circles around all my enemies. You know what? Pain Train does far more damage than I thought it would, by a lot. All it takes is one hydraulics powered forearm to the chest and a raider dies. One hit, who'd have thought? With all the raiders knocked unconscious, they're not dead, this is a children's game, I met Preston and his gaggle of idiots, went up to the roof, dropped to the ground like an angel of death, and turned the raiders into train tracks. And just like with one of my previous Fallout 4 videos, the only remaining problem here was the Death Claw. Pain Train does a traumatizing amount of damage to most low-level foes, but a Death Claw is not that. So I did the only thing I could think of that wouldn't involve my power armor or the person inside getting torn to shreds. The Death Claw can't get inside this little building here, and it's right in Preston's line of sight. All it takes is about 10 minutes of baiting the Death Claw to stay near the building, so Preston can attack it, and its health will be low enough that you can try to run into it, almost get your head ripped off, slam into it right as Preston lands the killing blow, so you reload a save because Preston doesn't get to say that he killed the Death Claw. The remaining Minuteman is now on his way to Sanctuary, as am I because I have things to do, mainly leveling up to get the Idiot Savant perk. Once I'd gotten it, Sturgis tasked me with making a few beds. I went a little overboard, but in my madness, I came up with something brilliant. Something that would have blown my mind if I understood the implications of what I just decided to do. I gathered a lot of wood when I was destroying Sanctuary. 807 pieces of wood, to be exact. That amount of wood can make 403 fence posts. Each one gives you two experience, but thanks to the Idiot Savant perk, you occasionally get six experience per fence post. Can you see where I'm going with this? You might be asking yourself, did this idiot really lay down 400 fence posts? Of course I did. What kind of person do you think I am? It was so successful that it leveled me up twice. But the perk noise kept going long after I stopped building, and let me tell you, that got old fast. But I wasn't done there, not by a long shot. All around Sanctuary are trees that give 12 to 20 pieces of wood each. And with a smile on my face, I ripped all those fuckers out of the earth to use to fulfill my twisted fantasy of a world that is only fence posts. This isn't construction adventures with Mitten Squad, so I won't spend too much more time on it, but with all the wood I gathered, I was able to put down 826 more fence posts to bring us up to a grand total of 1,229 fence posts. 
It truly is a sight to behold. With my ideas realized, I began heading south to make my way towards Diamond City. My initial plan was to stock up on stim packs at Diamond City and continue south until I got to the castle, because there were quite a few fusion cores stockpiled in the armory. I'm getting ahead of myself. I turned the raiders, Hassel and Trudy, into slime on the ground, sold and bought with Trudy, and kept moving until I found myself in the middle of a mole rat family reunion. A small problem with the pain train perk is that you do need to get a bit of a running start, which becomes a problem when the enemy is always gnawing on your shoelaces. After that situation was resolved, my fusion core was running on fumes. There was no way I'd be able to get to another fusion core before it crapped out on me. So I ditched the armor for the time being and traveled on foot. I can't attack anything on the road, but slight inconveniences that I've dealt with a few times but still are kind of annoying is my middle name. Sometime later, I attempted to help Paladin dance with his ghoul problem. They followed me into an alley and beat me up. Dance lost consciousness enough times that he probably had significant brain injuries, and I followed him to Arctret Systems because there's a fusion core in the reactor area. He did all the work on the way there, and bravely fought off some of his brothers and sisters until we got into the basement where I got my hands on another fusion core. I still couldn't fight back because of the implication, so Dance picked up the slack. I might have accidentally lit him on fire a little bit. I gave him his toy since he was so well behaved. I agreed to join his club, and I was back on the road. You might think that because I had a fusion core, I'd return to my armor. You would be metaphorically incorrect. My goal was still Diamond City. Along the way, I rescued a shopping cart from drowning and returned it to its family and, uh, that's about it. I didn't bother with the mayor or anyone else when I got to Diamond City. I went straight for the vendors. Arturo had an impressive four fusion cores, and with enough batteries to last almost 90 minutes, I reunited with my power armor, tried to stop a murder but stood in front of the wrong person, did the interview with Piper, had a pessimistic attitude about everything, got word from Ellie about her robotic friend, and was off to continue my campaign of idiocy. I used my powers as the living embodiment of Aqua Lad to repair some pipes and squash a few mire lurks. Met up with the settlers at Ten Pines Bluffs, kept my ulterior motives a secret, stole their tomatoes, and took on the raiders at Corvega Assembly Plant. These are still mostly low-level raiders, so despite there being a lot of them, they can be taken down with relative ease. It did take me a little while to figure out where the head goon was hiding out, but once I did, I turned his legs into silly putty, informed the nobodies of my successful rampage, and got to work scrapping every piece of wood they had, which was a disappointingly low amount. Any is better than none, but it wasn't worth the time I'd just spent at Corvega. In fact, I was only able to build another 120 fence posts with my recovered materials. I then talked to Preston about joining the Minutemen, just to let him feel excited for a little bit. Like when you ask your parents if you can go to Toys R Us this weekend, and they say maybe, when they really have no intentions of taking you to Toys R Us. I finished up the Sanctuary quest for Sturgis, was now level 15, and began heading to Park Street Station to save Nick. After getting into a scuffle with a few raiders, I bumped the difficulty up to normal, because killing almost everything with one hit felt too easy. I antagonized Swan, found out that his arm is a boat and not a mutated tentacle, which blew my mind, entered the station, and introduced my body to the Trigger Men. It was here, things got annoying. There were a few issues with the pain drain perk that I didn't realize until now. The first is that just like with a melee attack, sometimes the full speed of a body slam does nothing, probably because they can block it. The other problem is one I've already mentioned. You need a bit of a running start, which is a real pain to deal with. Also, by this point, the armor on my power armor had long since been destroyed, so I'm essentially just a giant shell. I took on the remaining trigger men, loitering around the vault entrance, fought a few inside, but largely ignored them because they weren't worth all the effort. Another problem I didn't mention was that sometimes you sprint into an enemy, you'll hear the sound effect, but nothing will happen. They'll just take no damage. That happened with Dino a few times, but I managed to save Nick and we began making our way out of the vault. It took a few attempts to convince Darla to leave Skinny Malone, allowing Nick and I to leave the vault for good and agree to meet back up at Diamond City to discuss my kidnapped offspring. He suggested searching Kellogg's house, so I smooth-talked Geneva to get a key to Kellogg's house, found his special room, met Dogmeat, and the two of us set off into the wasteland to track down Kellogg. For once, rather than fast traveling directly to Fort Hagen, I followed Dogmeat around as we searched for clues. We had so much fun together. We ran along the train tracks. We killed things. Then we killed more things. Dogmeat killed one of his cousins. He got overzealous and decided we should take on a Yao Guai which was going pretty well until Preston showed up and saved the day. This guy was a phony, so I told him off and watched him vanish into the fog, never to be seen again. A few minutes later, we arrived at Fort Hagen, and I dismissed Dogmeat because I had to do this alone. 
I knew that what was inside Fort Hagen would be tough, so I postponed the search for my son for a bit to journey north where a set of power armor is supposedly located. Surprisingly, this attack dog was the toughest thing I've fought so far. You wouldn't expect something with a handle to put up much of a fight, but this thing sure did. It wasn't long before my life became a Disney movie. In a beautiful forest, surrounded by friendly deer, was my exoskeleton in shining armor. I ditched my old armor because I wouldn't be needing it, returned to Fort Hagen, and took shelter inside the base because a green sky is usually a sign that a tornado's coming. The synths inside were not at all fun to deal with. Even the base synths took three hits to kill. The small upside is that when they're in a group, I can ram into all of them and do damage to the entire group, provided I actually hit them all. I didn't really need the experience, and fighting all the synths on the way to Kellogg would most likely destroy the armor I'd just gotten. So I ignored most of the synths until I was ready to face Kellogg. Here's a fun fact, you can't pain train someone if they're not an enemy. You can't immediately start the fight because Kellogg isn't initially hostile. It's not really an issue because sneak attacks are impossible, but it is yet another problem. I took some Med-X and Psycho to prepare myself for the battle, and when it began, I was more than prepared. I did more damage to Kellogg with my first few attacks than I thought I would, but his synths proved to be the real annoyance. Constantly attacking me and getting in my way, allowing Kellogg a chance to use a stim pack. Also, the fact that I had to wait for my AP to regenerate in order to sprint and attack him wasn't doing me any favors. It took longer than it usually does, but Kellogg eventually fell before me. I cleared out the remaining synths in the room, ransacked his brain, watched the Brotherhood of Steel's blimp arrive, went back to Diamond City, sold a bunch of stuff to Arturo, and talked to Nick and Piper about what to do next. We all agreed that the best course of action was to head to Good Neighbor. Dr. Amari agreed to do what she could with Kellogg's memories. I took a seat, relived a few memories, talked to Amari about some guy named Virgil. She told me he was out in the glowing sea, and I was on my way. The Glowing Sea is a lengthy jog away from anywhere I've ever been so far. It's far enough south that death claws are common. Luckily, they're incredibly stupid and can be avoided as long as there's a tree nearby. After taking far more radiation damage than I was comfortable with, I arrived at Virgil's cave, got a rundown on the plan, and left to find a courser. My first stop was CIT Ruins, where you're supposed to listen to a radio signal and follow the beeps. Not gonna do that because that's boring. Instead, I went straight for Green Tech Genetics. The gunners inside were tough, could take a healthy amount of damage, and were perfectly happy dishing it out as well. The good news is that this building is mostly long corridors, making it easy, though still time consuming, to take down them all. The only real trouble spot came from dealing with this guy with the missile launcher. Without the protection of actual armor, it does a lot of damage, but that only made it more satisfying when I charged into a group of three people and killed them all at the same time. Then came the coarser fight. Sneak attacks are usually my go-to method here, but they can't be used. Medex and Psycho can though. The pain train actually does a decent amount of damage. The biggest issue was his many stealth boys, which made hitting him a bit difficult. I pretty much turned myself into a boss fight by using the same tactic over and over again. Charge at him, retreat away from him to gain momentum, then attack him again. My tactic worked rather well. I got the crisp from his head, talked to Amari again, followed the freedom trail, solved their stupid puzzle, met Desdemona and her lackeys, and had the chip analyzed by Tinkerbell. I then left the church, returned to Virgil out in the glowing sea, got the teleporter plans from him, and had to decide which group to work with. My first thought was to side with the railroad. My only method of attack is the pain train. I named myself Thomas, after the tank engine. They seemed like the logical choice. Which is why I had Sturgis analyze the plans. After I built the initial platform, I got the remaining plans from Sturgis, put the entire thing together in record time, and was finally ready to take the next step. Everything I've done has been leading up to this. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Bedworld. I would have made more, but I ran out of materials. Then I tried to make the steel chair exhibit, but I reached the build limit. I was still more than satisfied with my work, so I stood near the platform, got teleported into the Institute, did the holotape thing for Sturgis, met Father, agreed to work with him, met the various Institute leaders, and got my first mission from Father. I returned to Sanctuary and saw that the steel chair exhibit was a raging success. I gave Sturgis his tape, fast traveled to the Old North Church, and began making my way to Libertalia. I interrupted a robot race and no one was happy about it. I retreated into the water, but they were relentless with their onslaught. Once I was free, I met the courser, he gave me the synth recall code, I tested the construction of a few wooden walkways, and quick saved at the worst possible time. I don't think I've ever gotten a more horribly timed quick save than this one. I quite literally had no choice but to reload another save and try again. 
The second time worked out much better. I made my way up to the raider's hideout, used the recall code, cleared out the other raiders, and told father that I'd done it good. He showed me how much he loved me by sending me off to war. The Battle of Bunker Hill. Not that tough, to be honest. I attacked some of the railroad heavies outside the gate and let the synths do most of the work to finish them off. The Battle of the Basement was much more gruesome. I found a legendary weapon and thought that a legendary item only playthrough might be interesting to try. Got some armor from a dead Brotherhood of Steel Knight, listened to how scared the synths were, used the recall code on them all, and almost railroaded my father into an early grave. I say almost because I couldn't have attacked him there even if I wanted to. He was less than impressed with the world around him, as most evil geniuses are. He told me to attend the directorate meeting. I tried to sit in his chair, but that's his spot, and he informed us all that he is officially dying. He named me the new director of the institute. I dubbed myself King Choo Choo and was ready to retrieve the Barnacle Aggravator from Mass Fusion. But I knew what was coming. I'd become enemies with the Brotherhood of Steel by teleporting to Mass Fusion. It was nerf or nothing, so I returned to Paladin Dance. After keeping him waiting for several days, we rode up to the Pridwin, and I got started. If you pickpocket a fusion core from a knight without getting detected, they leave their armor. If you're still hidden, you can take all the pieces from their armor for yourself, which is what I did. But wait, there's more. I dropped that set of armor off at Sanctuary, listened to Elder Maxon give his speech, introduced myself to the cast and crew of the Pridwin, and abused the VAT system to get inside Tegan's armory and steal an assortment of items, the most important of which were four fusion cores. Then I sold most of what I'd stolen to buy six more fusion cores, only four of which were at 100% charge, and began stealing the armor pieces from various sets of power armor that nobody was using. I had 16 fusion cores, three backup armor pieces for every limb, and having just performed the heist of the hour, I returned to the Institute to relay a mass fusion to find the Beryllium Agitator. The scribes and initiates are all a joke. The knights are tougher, but they're definitely worth killing as they have armor pieces and a fusion core. I used Ali Fillmore as a human shield. The elevator failed. I fixed it, went down to the reactor room, snagged the agitator, and things got bad. To escape with the agitator, you must defeat a sentry bot and two assaultrons. The sentry bot was worse, by a lot. It's quick, can stagger you with its karate skills, and has a ridiculous amount of health. I used the same tactic with it and the Assaultrons as I did with the Courser and Kellogg. Attack, retreat, attack again. With the day one in the name of science, I gave the agitator to Ali back at the Institute, interrupted father's medical evaluation, and went to a Grey Garden house to solve a little problem. The gunners outside never stood a chance. I convinced T.S. Wallace to join the Institute, recorded a message for the Commonwealth, played with the dials and buttons in the Diamond City radio room, installed the reactor, activated it, and attended my first directorate meeting as the big train. Father then informed me that the railroad would need to be wiped off the map. For a moment I was confused, dumbfounded even. I told Desdemona that I'd been working with the Institute. She told me to leave and never come back, but nobody would attack me. Then I stole an alarm clock, and as the bullets started flying, I knew everything was going to be alright. Most of them were easy to send to the afterlife. They could take a few hits, but nothing crazy. Glory was the exception, probably. I think being shot by a minigun can slow you down and prevent you from sprinting. Either that, or I'm stupid, it could honestly be either. Soon enough, Pam was all that remained of the railroad. I sent her offline with a forearm to the chest, looked at the mess I'd made, looked at the mess Glory had made, left the railroad forever, and informed father that the railroad were no more. He told me to let Dr. Lee know that it was time to destroy the Brotherhood of Steel. I momentarily saw what God sees and relayed to the airport. As you'd expect, the Boston airport is incredibly fortified with multiple knights in power armor, multiple turrets, and lower level peasants all over the place. Despite my power armor and the numerous points in damage resistant perks, they managed to end me. The next time, I ate my one emergency carrot and used the same tactic I've used several times. Then I died again. I wasn't doing this a third time, so I used one of my stealth boys and snuck into the garage, took out the few unarmored foes who were foolish enough to stand in my way, and before long, I'd reached an impasse. A situation that made this playthrough come to a grinding halt. You can't pain train these generators to destroy them. I tried jumping off the world's strongest lamp to land on the ground next to it since that does some damage, but it did nothing. I cannot destroy these generators using only power armor. I did think of something though. The point is to beat the game only using the pain train perk to kill enemies. 
you don't get experience for destroying generators. They don't count as enemies. So I pulled out my fists, destroyed the first, then the second, then the third generator, and the Brotherhood of Steel prepared to make their final stand against the might of the Institute. I had to fend off everything that remained of the Commonwealth chapter of the Brotherhood of Steel while an Institute virus infected Liberty Prime. For a moment, I thought to be a little punk bitch and leave my power armor blocking the staircase, then leave to fast travel back to Sanctuary to get my other set and use it to block the only other staircase up to Liberty Prime. This synth proved that it would be a viable option. I didn't do it though, because I was doing more than enough damage to everything in my path. Even Paladin Dance didn't stand much of a chance. It wasn't long before Elder Maxon arrived to do his part. I got a few hits on him, but I kept falling off the railing. I wasn't there in his final moments to hold his hand as he passed on, but I was more than willing to raid his corpse and dress myself in his armor. The virus synth finished just as the combat gorillas started arriving, and I was teleported to safety to watch the Pridwin go down in flames. I then returned to the Institute, spoke to Father one last time, and beat Fallout 4 by only using the Pain Drain perk. And that's going to do it for this video about whether or not you can beat Fallout 4 with only the Pain Drain perk. If you enjoyed this video or learned anything, leave a like. Leave a dislike if you didn't enjoy the video or didn't learn anything. Join the Mitten Squad Discord server through a link in the video description. Follow me on Twitter at Mitten Squad. My name is Paul of Mitten Squad. Have a wonderful day.